am Dan Rodriguez. I teach missions at Pepperdine University, where I've been for the last 18 years. And before that, I spent almost 10 years on the mission field in Mexico uh, with a team of missionaries from 1985 to 1994. Since 1994, I've been here at Pepperdine and been blessed to have the opportunity to meet a lot of young people interested in short-term and long-term missions. And so I'm hoping that the things I have to share with you today um, will be valuable, especially for those of you who will be leading teams uh, that are going to be partnering with local missionaries and indigenous leaders. So that's really what I want to do and share with you today. I've been asked to talk briefly about the dynamics involved with leading a team, especially a short-term mission team around the world, working somewhere in the developing world with at, an at-risk group that is probably being targeted and worked with by you know, long-term local missionaries and probably and especially indigenous leaders of that, of that people group in that part of the world. And I want to talk about some very special dynamics in those, in those contexts. Uh, we've experienced a paradigm shift in missions in the last 30 years, something that many people are only becoming vaguely aware of. And it's requiring, especially missionaries coming from North America, from the United States of America in particular, to rethink their role. And I guess the simplest way to say it is we have to give up the role of the great white hope in the mission field. Um, the, the center of gravity, as Phil Jenkins tells us in his books, has shifted. And now there are more Christians in the South and in the East than there are in the North Atlantic, including the United States and Europe, what have historically been the centers of Christianity and the primary sending you know, regions of the world. Uh, now we're seeing missions from every place to every place. But in the context in which you're going, probably one of the most challenging roles will be, one of the most challenging things to do will be to, a paradigm shift in your own mind, especially as the team leader. You might see yourself as someone trying to fill the role of an Apostle Paul, who has a team of Silas's and Timothy's and Luke's and Demas's and other people. Um, I'd like to challenge you to rethink that paradigm and maybe consider your role as, a, instead of being Paul on the mission field, leading your missionary team, that you're Barnabas. Barnabas had a very different role, wherever he was. And the role that you see Barnabas playing in the New Testament especially as it's revealed in the book of Acts, is more, I think, the role that we need for North American, especially white American missionaries to play in mission work in the future, in the early 21st century. That may change later, but I don't think so. Um, you're going to be working a lot more with missionaries. They may be foreign missionaries, let's say in, in Sub-Saharan Africa or in the Middle East or in East Asia, but very likely the missionaries are not going to be American missionaries. They could be African missionaries, they could be Korean missionaries, and the role that you're going to play partnering with them in an existing ministry is going to be very different than the role that missionaries have played in the past. And then if you're working with a team that is made up of indigenous leaders, they're Sudanese Christians working with Sudanese refugees, that role is going to be very unique. And walking in as the Apostle Paul leading a team of Timothys from the West, that, those days are passing. We need someone like Barnabas. If you remember Barnabas, Barnabas, when he goes in, just think of a few of the things that characterize Barnabas. One of the things that characterized Barnabas is that Barnabas was the kind of person that was very sensitive to his, his teammates, especially when they were young and immature, like many of your teammates are going to be. You're going to be leading people who maybe for the first time go on the mission field. Some of them are going to make ridiculously stupid mistakes. One of the things we learned from Barnabas, in the, particularly in the case where him and Paul go on the first missionary journey, and they take John Mark. John Mark bails. Later, when they're getting ready to start the second missionary journey, uh, in, chapter, in, the early, in the end of chapter 15, early parts of chapter 16 of the book of Acts, Barnabas and Paul end up you know, uh, splitting up and they split up over what to do with John Mark. Paul, of course, wanted to take only, you know, headhunters, only, you know, the special forces on his team. And Barnabas realized he needed to take John Mark. He needed to take someone who needed a second chance. And some of the people you'll be leading are going to require a second chance. When they make mistakes, they're going to need you as a team leader to protect them, to give them a second chance, especially when the local missionaries and the local indigenous leaders are wondering, why did you bring her? She doesn't have a clue. To be like Barnabas and put your arm around that person and say, 
they made a mistake and I will help that person, just like Barnabas. And who knows, maybe just like Barnabas, years later in the story that we read in the New Testament, whatever Barnabas did with John Mark, I don't know exactly what he did, but all I know is that when Paul is reflecting much later in his life, and he's thinking, I need someone right now to help me. He says, where's John Mark? He tells Timothy, bring John Mark. He's useful for my ministry. The one that Paul thought was useless later becomes useful. And what's the difference there? We don't know. All we know is one person was involved. It was Barnabas. And I think Barnabas invested heavily in his young nephew, John Mark. I think that's one thing we need. Another important characteristic of Barnabas that I think is easy to overlook. I mean, Barnabas himself is easy to overlook because he's working alongside this almost superhuman personality of the Apostle Paul. Another reason to maybe embrace this new paradigm shift that I'm suggesting is that very few of us will ever have the skill sets or the, the power of the Holy Spirit in our life to really be an Apostle Paul. But a lot of us, in fact all of us, can embrace the role of Barnabas. One of the things that we're told about Barnabas in chapter 11 in the book of Acts, he's sent to check out this brand new fledgling church in Antioch. And when he gets there, he has a skill that very few people have. He's able, we're told, he's able to see the evidence of the grace of God in that brand new community. He sees something that especially the, the Jewish circumcised Christian brothers could not see. He saw in these brand new Gentile Christians incredible potential. In fact, he, we're told that he saw the evidence of the hand of God in their lives. And instead of going back to Jerusalem, he ended up staying there. He decided, and that may be what's going to happen to some of you who are team leaders. Some of you may thinking, be, be thinking, I'm just going on this short-term mission. I'm taking these people. Just be aware. Just like Barnabas, he was sent on a short-term mission to check out what was going on in Antioch. And he never went home again. So be prepared for God to do something great in your life. And it's very likely to happen if you open your eyes and ask God, show me, God, what you're doing in this community that is easy to overlook. And the reason it's often easy to overlook is because many of the places that you're going to be working, the, the, the people who are doing such amazing things are nobodies, technically. They don't have any theological training. They've never been to preacher schools. They're maybe illiterate. They're single moms. They're orphans. And they're doing great things for God. And one of the things that sets Paul, Barnabas apart is that Barnabas is able to see in the ordinary, in the often marginalized and forgotten people, the hand of God. And what he does is encourage them and stays and it works alongside them. But he doesn't ever take over. That's another thing. Again, because we want to accept the role of Barnabas and not, by Paul, not of Paul. You know, it's very easy for people in many of the developing contexts in which you're going to find yourself. They're going to see you as this college graduate, this person with money, a uh, person with influence, and they're going to want to just yield to your leadership. Like Barnabas, you need to back away and allow God to use them. You partner with them. Empower them. And resist the temptation, oh, it's so great. When people say, we need you, we're so thankful that you're here. To say, no, I'm thankful that you're here and I'm here to help God continue to nurture what he's already doing in your life. And when it's time to move on, move on. And that's what Barnabas was able to do. He was able to move on when it was time to move on. Let me just say one more thing about Barnabas that I think is very important to observe. If you're going to embrace Barnabas as your paradigm leading your new team. One of the things that Barnabas learned very early in, the, in his first missionary journey, him and Paul, they go to a place called Lystra. And when they get to Lystra, there is this beggar sitting in front of the gate of the city. I can imagine that Paul and Barnabas walking up to the gate and seeing the beggar there. Maybe it was Barnabas who actually said to Saul, he was still being called Saul then, Hey Saul, see the beggar there? Do you remember Acts chapter 3 when Peter and John walked into the temple in Jerusalem and there was a beggar sitting in front of the gate and in the name of Jesus they healed the beggar. The beggar got up, was suddenly able to walk for the first time in his entire life and 5,000 people as a result of that were drawn and heard the message of Christ and surrendered. And I can't help but imagine that when you look at chapter 13 when they're pulling up to Elystra, a pagan city, they see this beggar sitting in front of the gate of the city, not in front of a temple. And they decide, hey, it worked in Jerusalem, let's try it in Lystra. 
And so in the name of Jesus, just like Peter and John did in chapter 3, in chapter 13, they say in the name of Jesus, rise and walk. And the man there from Lystra rises and walk. The, the miracle happened just like it did in chapter 3, but the people were not Jews. That was a very different context. And what we read about is that immediately the people thought that they were Zeus and Mercury. They thought they were pagan gods who had come to earth and they wanted to offer sacrifices to them. And I'm sure Barnabas after that thought, that was stupid. Paul probably asked him, what was stupid? Thinking that what works in Jerusalem is going to work in Lystra. That what works back home in the United States or in Texas or in Tennessee or in Malibu is going to work somewhere else. Or that what's happening there in Sub-Saharan Africa or in the Middle East or somewhere in Asia or wherever you happen to be working would work better than it's working now if they just did it the way you do in Nashville. If, you, if they just did it the way you do it back in Dallas or right there at the University Church in Malibu. What we have to remember is to resist that temptation. Every situation is different. Paul learned the lesson, and he tells the Corinthians later in chapter 9, verses 20 to 23, he says, I've become all things to all men, so that by all possible means I can win some. That means you don't just take something and export it around the world because it works back home. And so you need to trust the local missionaries. You need to trust the local indigenous leaders. They may be doing something in a way that to you sounds like what they used to do back in Nashville in the 1950s. You have to resist that urge. And you need, like Barnabas, to trust what God is already doing there. Particularly because you're only there for a little while. Too many short-term missionaries, in my experience, have come in, disrupted things. Six, four weeks, eight weeks later, they're gone. But the problems that they cause are there for years to come. Very disruptive, especially if it causes disruptions between the younger generation and the older generation. Many of you are younger. And so I hope that one of the things you do, like Barnabas, is be respectful of the different cultural contexts you find yourself in and trust the people that God has been using there and will be using long after you come back home to the United States.